the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. Edgar Baker, Managing Director of Time Life International, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, Editor of The Freeman and Contributing Editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Hubert H. Humphrey, United States Senator from Minnesota. The opinions discussed are necessarily those of the speakers. Well, Senator Humphrey, I see that the New York Times this morning credits you with a very important victory in helping to get past the uh, President's reorganization plan of the Internal Revenue Bureau. Uh, the Times wrote the victory was less a personal one for the President than it was for three freshman senators who led the fight. Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota, Mike Monroney of Oklahoma, and Blair Moody of Michigan. So could you begin by telling us what the reorganization plan does, Senator? Well, the key to the reorganization plan, or the crux of it, is that it removes the political patronage system from the Office of the Collector of Internal Revenue. In other words, it places the appointment of all the collectors of internal revenue in the many revenue districts strictly under the civil service system, the competitive merit examination. I think this is highly desirable. I think that we have had uh, plenty of uh, demonstration of the inadequacy of the politically appointed collectors of internal revenue. It well, places a, a <coughs> premium upon competence and technical background. Well, uh, Senator, if my memory is correct, of the 64 uh, present collectors, uh, seven have either been forced to resign or have discharged. Now, doesn't that mean that the uh, president's plan is, in effect, a plan to prevent himself from uh, making bad appointments? Well, as a matter of fact, the President Truman made none well, of these well, appointments, uh, may either I say. He or, or Senator, either he or President Roosevelt, I meant to say. Or yes. any president, yes. because may yes. I say that back in the good old days, uh, the days when Andrew Mellon was Secretary of the Treasury, we had an even worse situation than we had now. I don't mean to inject the but partisanship into it, but it's literally true. There but were, these are not holdovers from the Mellon... Uh, they're not holdovers, position. but the political patronage system just has not produced the kind of caliber and talent that we should have in an office that's as important as the Collector of Internal Revenue's office plus the fact that the present uh, collector's office is a busy office. You have over 70 million tax returns, for example, about 50 million taxpayers. And when you consider the tremendous number of taxes that a collector of internal revenue must be responsible for, I think he ought to be recruited and hired on the basis of technical skill, background, experience, and all that comes with a competitive merit system examination. Well, Senator, the, the, the passage of the bill is very timely. The idea yes. of March and <laughs> the final date for tax payment are close upon us. I understand that you are in favor of an even tighter tax bill. Is that correct? I'm in favor of what I call a tighter or a more honorable tax structure. That is absolutely true. I uh, per personally believe that the entire tax structure of our country needs a basic overhauling. It has grown pretty much like topsy. Every time we've needed a little more revenue, we've fished around to find some new way of adding a new tax to the tax structure. In the meantime, some people have been fishing around to see how they could get out of paying taxes. Senator, what specific recommendations would you make? Well, my recommendations uh, have been termed, uh, not by myself alone, but by many others over the, the years, uh, loophole uh, plugging uh, provisions. Uh, by that I mean uh, tightening up the tax structure in reference to uh, uh, certain specific uh, tax allowances or tax uh, special treatment taxes that we have in the tax system, such as the capital gains tax structure, family partnerships, uh, the failure to have withholding upon corporate bond interest and dividends, uh, the uh, split income provisions, uh, 
the uh, uh, depletion allowances for gas and oil wells. There are other such uh, little tax matters as corporate spin -offs. Well, Senator, suppose we take the first one you mentioned, the it's capital very gains right. tax. So yes. What would you do about that? What's your re recommendation on that? Well, first of all, I want to make my position quite clear. I think that the capital gains tax schedule, which is to be differentiated from the earned income schedule and the corporate income schedule, is a legitimate tax schedule. I mean, it has a legitimate purpose. The uh, purpose for it, when it was enacted, was to promote investment, capital improvement and investment. Uh, the original capital gains was for 25% tax, maximum of 25%, but you had to hold your property or your bond or your stock for a period of two years to give a sense of legitimacy to the investment. Now that period, that holding period, has been reduced from two years to one year to six months, and in the last two sessions of the Congress, they've tried to cut it down to three months when speculation has been rampant, particularly. Uh, by the way, every time you have a defense or a war situation, they always want to cut down the holding period uh, on capital gains. Well, Senator, uh, isn't it true that on the other side, you cannot deduct capital losses against income? You can deduct... Well, except, except against about $3,000. So capital losses are not deductible. Uh, therefore, you can't, shouldn't tax capital gains as full income, should you? Well, Mr. Hazlitt, I'm sure that you and I will have quite a disagreement about that because when you talk about capital gains and capital losses, you can deduct capital losses from your capital gains. From capital gains, but so not against your income. In the same house. You yes, can't but play you, both but sides you have to add here. your capital gains tax to your income tax, but you cannot deduct your capital losses from your income. That's yes, correct, but, isn't but it? Now, wait a minute. When and you isn't that a heads I win, tails you lose? No, what you have is the, the, government. Head, the government loses and tails you oh, win. Oh, I'm sorry if the heads of the government <laughs> wins, but the tails you lose, you the taxpayer loses, because well, you can't deduct it against your income. Now, now that's a simple fact, Senator. Mr. Hazlitt. There are I'm several, you there are several you would propose, and you're propose. a wise economist, and you know that there are three basic tax structures in this country. The kind I pay, which is earned income tax, the kind that a corporation pays, which is corporate tax, and the kind that a speculator pays, which is capital gains tax. And the guy that's speculating on the market pays a lower tax rate than a worker that's earning $7,500 a year. Not on short-term gain. On a short-term short gain. No, on a, a short-term gain, he pays the same as a income tax. On a six-months gain, if he holds... Well, that is not considered a short-term gain well, for a speculator. That's it used to be... It used to require... A can't sit around six months. It used to require two years for capital that's gains. Right. What I am saying, but, Mr. Hazlitt, is that if you lose in the capital gains market, you can, re you can deduct your losses from your capital gains and you only pay 20, 26 percent right. under the present law upon your earnings. But you either However, pay a if tax I or lose, tax. If I lose as a wage earner, if I lose as a wage earner one year, I cannot go back and deduct it for my taxes that I paid the other year. But you don't you pay Senator, taxes it, it, they, Senator they, Humphrey, yes. that, that's an area in which, in which I believe um, both or all three sides of the, of, the, of the argument are agreed that whatever change might be made would be comparatively moderate. There's another area uh, you mentioned earlier the, earlier the phrase depletion allowance, one that we hear a great deal about. Would you, would you care to explain in, in, in general terms what the principle of the depletion allowance is? Yes, I give a little historical background on the depletion allowance. Uh, it was enacted in the Congress, I believe, in the year 1925 or 26, uh, right around that period. And the purpose of the depletion allowance for gas and oil and some mining interests, like sulfur, for example. It's now been extended further to it's other... It's been extended to about 45 commodities. And by the way, that's, that's another one of the tricks. We even got it on oyster shells now, a depletion allowance. Well, now, it's been extended by whom, Senator? By, by the, the Congress, Congress. By the Congress, over the objections of the executive, every time a special interest group, sand and gravel boys, wanted to get in on it last time. Well, now, do what you think is the depletion? it's wicked to have a depletion allowance no. when there's real depletion? No, I think a depletion allowance that's fair and equitable in terms of the scientific tech or the technology of the day is legitimate. Now, the purpose of the depletion allowance at first was to promote exploration of oil and gas uh, fields. So we had a depletion allowance of 27.5%. But since that time, may I say, the scientific knowledge of uh, where a gas field is and where an oil field is is much better than it was in 1925. But isn't, well, it, but isn't it also true, Senator? Much, oh, just a yes. minute. I'd just like to get this. Do they actually know how much uh, oil is under the ground? Oh, no, not in every instance. Well, then they don't know how much they're depleting it, do they? But Mr. Hazlitt, a man in business gets what he calls a depreciation allowance. If you have a $100,000 factory, about you can depreciate it. Yes. Now, a depletion allowance is a 27.5% upon your gross revenue. Well, if and you're the depleting it in three years, then that would be right. You argue that they're depleting it in a longer period. Plus the, fact, plus the fact that a man that drills an oil well and finds a dead hole, when he finally hits one, he can take all of the deductions for all of the losses that he had before. But Senator, there are isn't 45 that... separate gratuities or benefits given by the government for mining, 
and gas and oil development. But 45, which you didn't have in 1925, and I say that it's absolutely wrong in the year 1952 to have a depletion allowance of 27.5% on gross income when you have 45 special benefits today, which you didn't have at the time that the law was enacted. That's a tremendous change in a great many respects between 1925 and 1952, however, mm -hmm. insofar as, as the supply of oil and other critical raw materials are concerned. That's correct. The supply is even, the known supply today is much greater than it was in 1925. Known and is many I times say greater. that the bond market for gas and oil wells are gilt-edged securities, and the profit percentage in gas and oil development is above any other commodity in the American market. Well, Senator, as a last question, as a final question, do you think that there is a prospect in the near future of a reduction of taxes generally, or do you think the prospect is for higher taxes? Well, I think it greatly depends upon the international situation. And I think the American people must know that the high schedule of tax today is primarily the result of the great international crisis. It is my feeling that as we level off and taper off on our rearmament program that we can get these taxes down, and I think they should come down. The earned income tax and the corporate tax are terribly high. They're very high. And it's for that reason that I say that we should plug up these special treatment areas and thereby be able to at least level off the earned income tax rate and the corporate tax rate so that you don't knock out incentive in business and that you do not place an undue burden upon the individual that is having a pretty tough time making it go in this inflated period. Well, Senator, thank you very much for your answers. They've been very illuminating and we appreciate very much your being with us tonight. Thank you. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Edgar Baker and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Hubert H. Humphrey, United States Senator from Minnesota. The Winter Olympic Games recently completed at Oslo in Norway were exclusively timed by Longines to a tenth and a hundredth of a second. This telegram that I have here is our reward. Longines equipment used for all timekeeping during the Winter Olympic Games 1952. All worked perfectly. Thanks for your valuable cooperation. And it's signed, the organizing committee. Now that's a wonderful telegram and we're ever so pleased. Longines was actually official watch for the three great Olympic sports events during the past year. The Winter Olympics at Oslo, the third Bolivarian Games at Caracas in Venezuela, and the first Pan American Games held in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And now we are proud to announce that the United States Olympic Committee has selected Longines watches for timing all events for the selection of the United States Olympic team of 1952. So you see, wherever precise timing is important, in sports, aviation, and science, as in everyday life, the preeminent choice of watches is Longines, the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you again that Longines and Wetnor watches are sold and serviced by more than 4,000 leading jewelers from coast to coast who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.